All right, let's fucking crack on with this. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Thursday's edition of the Chris Pritchard Cycling News Show. Just want to say a huge thank you to anybody who took part in the Wahoo Look All fueled by SIS Zwift social ride that we have just done. Well, depending when you watch this video, actually, uh, we, we, we just finished it and I've dropped this video. So thank you so much. If you want to get involved in the next one, then follow me over on Instagram, Chris underscore Pritch underscore, where I'll be posting the link and you'll be able to join. It is a secret event, so you can't just go on the companion app and find it. You need to come and see Pritch and get the link, which segues us nicely into the new lockdown here in the UK. But as cyclists, what the hell are we allowed to do? Let's have a transition and I'll tell you. Eish. Now, before I tell you exactly what you can and can't do here in the UK, now the new lockdown comes into place today, hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, hit that notification bell so you know when we go live with our live streams or our videos. You know what my goal is, 35,000 of you by the end of the year. Come on, make it happen. Do yourself a favour, do me a favour and hit that subscribe button. Right. So here in the UK, lockdown 2.0 starts today, but what does that actually mean for cyclists? Now, during the last lockdown, there was lots of restrictions in place for cyclists. At one point, I think we were limited to one hour of exercise. Uh, we potentially, I can't quite remember, but we might have potentially not been allowed to cycle. I know that in various different places, there was um, a limit on the radius that you could actually be away from your house. But from what I'm reading over on British Cycling's website, it seems that this lockdown isn't quite as harsh for cyclists. We're still going to be able to get out and we're still going to be able to ride. The only issue is now we've got to consider is the fact that if we are still working, the nights are a lot shorter, so you potentially might not be able to go out. So this might be a perfect opportunity for me to plug my link down in the description. If you want to get anything set up for your indoor training setup, follow the link, head over to Wahoo, purchase it, then you can ride in the safety and the comfort of your own home. And you'll help out the channel a little bit as well. But if you are considering being out there and still riding, I am, I'm going to be still getting out there. What the British Cycling and the government actually advise that we can and can't do? Well, Pritchard. Why don't you tell them? All right, so the guidance from British Cycling says that you can ride outside alone with those in your household or support bubble or with one person from another household. If you're riding with someone from another household, you must only ride as a pair. You must stay two metres apart from anyone not from your household or support bubble. Does that rule extend to people driving past you? I mean, we could do with it. Like, everybody should know nowadays exactly how far two metres is away. Right? So just take that concept, apply it to the road. Stay two metres away from cyclists. Knobheads. I was out yesterday, day before, and the amount of people that were close passing me, I want to, I want to punch them in the face. Two metres, knobheads. Two metres. There are no restrictions on how far or how often you can ride, but British Cycling says you should stay within your ability level and prepare accordingly, especially when you're riding alone. So there you have it. Nothing really changes for cyclists, which is great. <laughs> like for someone who works from home and a lot of people who will now be working from home again or potentially not even working at the minute, like cycling has been my saviour. Cycling outdoors has been that moment in my life where I can go out and I can just relax. It takes the stress, it takes the strain, it gives me that endorphin hit I need that I don't normally get without it. So it's so important to make sure one, you don't get corona, and two, your mental well-being stays as good as it can be. So if you are in England, if you want to get back out on the bike, then make sure you do so. Obviously, like I said before, it's going to be a lot harder now, the nights are getting shorter, but hopefully if you are working from home, you might get that opportunity in the daytime to actually get out, and even if it's half an hour or an hour, just get out there, get some fresh air, get some exercise, ride your bike, it'll make you feel way better. Let me know down in the comments below, how is this lockdown going to affect you? How is it going to affect your cycling? Um, are you prepared for it? Uh, it? Let's not make it all pol political and say we shouldn't be doing it. It is what it is. All right. I just want to know what your cycling habits will be like during this lockdown period. And who out of all of us is making the banana bread? Let me know down in the comments below. Next up, a story that we covered a few months ago now. This is the Fabio Jakobsen and Dylan Guinevegen crash at the Tour of Poland. 
the massive crash that left Fabio Jakobsen in a serious state. And in fact, we've got an update from him. He posted on Twitter a couple of days ago saying this. Four weeks after the reconstruction of my upper and lower jaw, it was time for the stitches to come out. The process of healing is going well. The transplanted bone has grown strong and firm for the next four months now. Next surgery is scheduled in 2021. In a couple of weeks, my pelvic crest should be healed and strong like before again. From then, I can slowly start training on the bike again. So this race, Tora Poland, was uh, three months ago now. Uh, and Jakobs, it must have been in a serious way if he's kind of, you know, still in that recovery period, having skin grafts, having bone grafts by the sound of it. I mean, that, that guy is, is lucky to be alive. But the news isn't necessarily about his update. It was about the fact that the UCI are reportedly going to be punishing Dylan Grunewagen for this incident with a nine-month ban. Like the guy hasn't been through enough. Uh, it's been reported that he's been in struggling, again, like I said earlier, um, with people in lockdown, with his mental health. The amount of abuse he received for it. He's, he's been struggling to maintain any form of normal life by the sounds of it. I, I, and that's the only the stuff we've heard of. I dread to think what he's actually going through. It must, be, it must be unbelievable to have to deal with all that. People slagging him off, people having to go at him online. But then to have to live with the consequences and the, the repercussions of his actions during that sprint. Now, we can talk to the cows come home about whether it was intentional or not but but top and bottom of it is is he, it was never intentional to to get a rider to crash it was never his intention to make a rider crash right it, it wasn't whether he whether he he deviated from his line slightly to try and put Jakobsen off that's open for debate but the fact that he tried to intentionally make a rider crash or fall off that's that's not the case at all no one expected what happened during that uh, sprint to have actually happened um, better safety precautions put in place by the organizers could have meant that potentially Jakobsen could have hit that fence slid down the side of it stayed within the vicinity of the actual race potentially got hit by a couple of riders but ultimately would have come off a lot better than what actually happened because of inferior safety precautions taken by the organizers. Let me know your comments down below. Me personally, it's far, the guy has served enough of a punishment. The UCI should see that. He might potentially never ride his bike again. And I know what you're gonna say, yeah, but Jakobsen could have died. And he could have died, but it wasn't his intention to try and make him die. It was his intention to potentially put a rider off and win a sprint. Nine months is, is just far too harsh a uh, punishment. I don't think he should be punished. I think he should be, he should, well, in terms of deviating from his line, he should have been issued with a disqualification uh, or, or a, um, a relegation in that sprint. But they're punishing him because of what happened, because of the aftermath of what happened, not because he slightly deviated from his line. Like we've seen it time and time again, people are getting away with it when they deviate from their line if they don't cause an, uh, an accident. But anyway, it'd be interesting to get to know your thoughts because there are probably people out there that say he tried to do that, he did it on purpose. Um, if that's the case, try and be respectful of, of Dylan Grunewagen and actually bring something positive to the table. Anyway, that's enough of that. I think both riders have... Anyway, I'll keep you updated on that once that actual... Anyway, I'll keep you updated on that when that actual punishment... Uh, comes in. Loosh. Next up, massive breaking news. Literally, as I came to start filming this, with all my news that I had planned, Ian Stannard is being forced to retire at the end of 2020 due to rheumatoid arthritis. This is a massive shock. This is this is huge. Like it's Ian Stannard. It's Yogi. Like, I love him. He's one of he's one of the best riders ever. I'm to retire. Over on the Ineos Grenadiers website, they released this statement saying, After a hugely successful career, British rider Ian Stannard has been forced to retire from professional cycling due to rheumatoid arthritis. Exactly what I just said earlier. Stannard has been with the team since its launch in 2010. Blooming hell, I, I, I totally forgot he, he's never been anywhere else. 
Blooming hell. Former national champion Stannard ends his racing career with seven wins, including two at the Tour of Britain and as a key member of five Grand Tour winning lineups. But he will be most fondly remembered for his efforts in the classics, winning back to back editions of. Omloop at Newsblad in 2014 and 15 before riding to a third in Paris Roubaix in 2016. Stanard said, Disappointing to have to stop like this, but it's clearly the, the right decision for my health and my family. Uh, we've explored all the options this year to deal with my condition, uh, and the team been there every step of the way. I started to hope that I could manage the problem during lockdown, uh, but as soon as I had to return to racing, I knew that my body wouldn't be able to perform at any level anymore. What a way to, to have to be forced into retirement. This guy still had talent, clearly. He still had wins in him. And it must be hard to come to terms, never winning a monument, knowing that you're capable of winning it. Like, he was more than capable of winning Pai Roubaix on his day. It's so sad to... Well, he's sad, but on the other hand, he's had an amazing career, he's had an amazing opportunity, and he's done some amazing things that the majority of us will, will never get a chance to do. So, on one hand, it's, it's crappy, but on the other, you've got to look and think, bloody hell, what an amazing job that guy's done. He'll be sorely missed in the pellet on this guy. He'll be sorely missed from all classics racers when racing gets underway and continues as normal, whenever, whenever that might be. But um, not that he watches the show, but I just want to extend my gratitude for, for him for entertaining us. And hopefully he goes on to, to, to bigger and better things. But fuck, that sucks, man. Another rider that's been forced into retirement is Johan Ofredo. He announced his retirement from professional cycling in an interview with L'Equipe this week. The 33-year-old suffered an ankle injury which dated back all the way to March 2019 when he suffered a temporary paralysis and he was airlifted to hospital after crashing at the GP Denain. He said in the interview, I used to hear people talk about uh, the small death when a rider retires, but for me, that was abstract. When you're racing, you have your head in the handlebars and the blinkers on. I like to talk things through, but I don't have many people to do that with. I don't necessarily have many friendships with other riders. I am in a bit of a depressive phase. Last year, Peter Kenyuk and Marcel Kittel stopped because of depression, but that word is still taboo. Most riders don't express themselves or hide behind appearances. Me, when I wake up in the morning, I'm sad not to be in touch with my emotions. I just need to rediscover an objective in life. And it's weird that he should mention that because we've got a podcast coming up um, probably next week now where we actually talk a lot about mental health and we talk about um, this subject, which is pretty close to me, like, listen... <laughs> These boys on another level to whatever, to anything I ever achieved in cycling. But I understand fully what he says about this feeling of, of losing your identity when you can no longer call yourself a cyclist. Like, yeah, I've been there, man. It sucks. It sucks. So hopefully we can send him this podcast. He can have a listen and hopefully we'll, um, we'll, we'll help him out a little bit. But that, yeah, like Stannard will be exactly the same. You'll sit down one day and you'll be like, I'm no longer Ian Stanard the cyclist. Like, who even am I anymore? Like, I put all this time and effort into this amazing career and I didn't even really think about what I was going to do after it. It's, it can't be easy. That's the same for, for, for anybody that gets attached to something that's beyond them, whether that's like a football or a sports person or a business person. It's like, like without YouTube, who am I? I'm just a knobhead talking to a camera. Do you know what I mean? So it must be really, really difficult for these riders. I mean, the fact that they got paid pretty handsomely must help, but money isn't everything. But at least it should pay for a good therapist to actually get you through that. Or just listen to our podcast, Johan. Free, in it. Link's down in the description if you want to uh, go and listen to it on iTunes or, or Spotify. Thanks for listening. All right, and then finally in the show, let's talk Lev Welter. We saw the individual time trial after the second rest day, stage 13, and we also saw stage 14. Stage 15 is currently going off as we speak, but let's get up to date on the GC and everything that went off in those two stages previous to stage 15, stages 13 and 14. So stage 13 was the individual time trial. It was William Barter who set the early pace. He would be the one to beat. He had a relatively slow bike change in comparison to a lot of the riders, but got himself underway quickly and he would set the benchmark for the GC contenders and the rest of the time trialists at 46 minutes and 40 seconds. 
I mean, he could have saved at least three seconds if he'd have straightened his glasses up. Look at that. Ooh. Who dressed him this morning? One rider looking for a good result was Hugh Carthy, and he would get it. Maybe not as quick as I potentially thought he was going to go, but one rider on form and doing a hell of a lot better than the last time trial, um, at his last Grand Tour, Primoz Rodlich, smooth bike change. Like Damon Hill coming in for a Formula One pit stop. He was in and he was out and he was spinning that gear like mad, but he eventually settled down into his rhythm. This was the moment right here when Hugh Carthy remembered that he left all his pawn mags out on his bed for his mum to... It's Tuesday and his mum was cleaning up on Tuesday, so he realised that she was going to catch him out and he would come over the line 24 seconds down on Barter, all because of that little lapse in concentration. Remembering his mum likes to clean up on a Tuesday. Primoz Rodlich, however, he would come home one second ahead of Barter, giving him the stage victory meaning that Barta misses out on his first ever Grand Tour victory. One second between him and Barta. Oliveira was in third, 10 seconds down, and 25 seconds down was Hugh Carthy. In terms of GC, that keeps Rodlich in that red jersey and extends his lead over Carapaz at 39 seconds and Hugh Carthy at 47 seconds. Now, stage 14 was one for the breakaway. You can see the remnants of it here. One man at the front that was bossing it was Tim Wellens, Cameron Jeffers' new best mate. Ooh, just because he lives in Monaco, not bad. Anyway, the only rider to try and challenge him was Michael Woods. It looked like Woods potentially might do it, but around this very tight left-hander, he just didn't have enough to get round him. Wellens takes his second victory to add to stage number five, where he won four seconds ahead of Guillaume Martin, if you remember rightly. I know that because I just looked at it on internet. While he was swigging his water down, having a rest, the rest of the GC contenders came in three minutes... Well, three and a half minutes down eventually. Dan Martin thinking his calf, sprinting it out. Primoz Rodlic was making sure that there was no time gaps between any of them. And they all came over uh, pretty safely, really. Primoz there, supping some... Hey, blooming, hey, Primoz, how much do you love milk? In milk, brilliant! Yeah, in it. There you go. GC stays exactly the same as it was prior to stage 14. Stage 15 is going off now. I have no idea what's going on, but you'll find out soon enough what did happen. I don't know what you're thinking. Pritch, I don't know your vapes. Well, I don't. But this company, Eagle Energy, sent out these, well, essentially they are vapes, but it's, it's, a, it's a natural caffeine that you can um, inhale rather than consume in a, um, in a liquid form, i.e. coffee. And I'm not too sure how I feel about them. Like, the product seems to work, but what I'm concerned of is, it's a vape. Like, I'm not a smoker, never been a smoker, never been a vapor. And I'm, 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 I'm unsure how I feel about vaping. Like, as a cyclist who wants to keep his lungs clean and fresh and open, technically it's got nothing bad in it. It's only got caffeine in it that allows me to be more energized and more focused. But like, as, a, as cyclists, would you ever consider vaping your caffeine rather than taking it in a in a liquid form i'm probably going to do a, like a, a bit of a review on these and, and chat more about it but yeah i just saw it in my drawer and i thought oh i wonder what you lot think to that eagle energy links down in the description if you want to find more about it it's not specifically a vaping product but it is a vaping product but it's for mind focus this is not an ad i'm just I'm, they sent it and i was just thinking about it so Anyway, we'll talk more about that if you want to later another time. Anyway, if you've not done already, please hit that like button. Please hit that subscribe button and that notification bell if you want to stay abreast of all the latest cycling news as well as when we go live with our live streams. There should be a link in the description potentially to the next uh, Wahoo Lacol Fuel by SIS social ride. So if you want to get involved in that, link should be down there. Or go and follow me over on socials, Chris underscore Pritch on Instagram and um, on the underscore and then you can um, you can follow me there and you can get all the information you need there thanks for watching see you next time Thanks.